Thanks for joining. Um, I'm Matt Werner. I'm a technical writer here at Google. Uh, I work in enterprise, so I write uh, some of our public-facing documentation on Google Apps, and lately I've been writing on Android and Chrome OS. So, but today I'm going to be talking about uh, my writing outside of work, and uh, just give you a little overview of the talk. First, I'm going to talk, uh, give you a little bit of background on Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentinian author uh, that I wrote my book on. Uh, then I'm going to cover a little bit about my research in the self-publishing, and also why I chose specifically to self-publish as opposed to more traditional means of publishing. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the self-publishing process, how I actually printed and made my book, uh, and that'll lead into a little bit of the print first ebook debate, uh, and then I'll give a very short reading from my book, and then I'll have a Q&A. So that's a little bit for the structure of the talk. So to give you a little bit of background on Jorge Luis Borges, that's the uh, Argentinian author uh, pictured above in the very big uh, enlarged photo. And that's me with uh, Maria Kodama, his widow. So Borges lived from 1899 to 1986, and he's considered the national writer of Argentina. Uh, he was the precursor to the boom movement in Latin America, and he wrote a number of uh, kind of fantastic stories, stories which influenced a lot of writers who came later, uh, who, who wrote in this sort of magical realist uh, style. And some call him an early postmodernist. And sort of the premise of my book is that Borges wrote fake book reviews of books that didn't exist. And so what I did is I took one of these fake books mentioned in Pierre Menard, Author the Quixote, and I actually wrote this book. And so that's why I have this uh, funny title for my book, Papers for the Suppression of Reality, uh, because uh, that was the, uh, it was a French title that he used in, uh, in Pierre Menard, author the Quixote. And so I call this the, it's loosely translated from the French into English. So that's a little bit of uh, background. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I went from uh, my 2007 trip to Buenos Aires uh, to my first book reading and sort of what was the process in between. Um, so yeah, again, so as part of the research, so. Here I am in Borges' library in Buenos Aires. Uh, he was the uh, national librarian of Argentina. And um, so kind of the, the background is uh, in 07, I went down to Buenos Aires because I'd studied Borges and his writing for most of my undergrad career uh, at UC Berkeley. And uh, while I was there, there was, um, people didn't really know if Maria Kodama, Borges' widow, was still alive. When I went around and asked, um, and they said Borges passed away in 1986, so they didn't really know if she was still alive. Uh, but I ended up meeting her at the uh, Jorge Luis Borges International Foundation, which was actually a few blocks from where I was staying. So this is me in a completely unstaged photo researching. Uh, I frequented a lot of the bookshops, talked with people. People had really fascinating stories about uh, their experiences with Borges. And um, because he passed away when I was two, uh, I didn't really have the experience to really meet and chat with him, but it was fascinating talking with people in Buenos Aires about their, their memories and stories of him. So uh, segueing into self-publishing, so I looked into a lot of different methods because uh, in the past uh, I, I interned and volunteered at McSweeney's Publishing in San Francisco. Uh, they're a small independent publisher and they put out a lot of very unique books. Um, I also worked at Pearson Higher Education uh, which is the world's largest textbook publisher. And so they're a very traditional publishing house. Uh, but then I researched kind of non-traditional ways. If I didn't want to go with a Manhattan-based large publishing house, what, what could I do? So uh, this photo right here is the Espresso Book Machine, which was actually here in the main Google lobby, uh, where uh, what you do is you could find uh, uh, like an out-of-copyright book on Google Books uh, and you could just essentially hit print, and within five minutes, the completed book would fall out of this, this slot right here. So it, it was a pretty uh, incredible exhibit, and then I, I met one of the uh, uh, in, inventors there, and we, we talked quite a bit. It was real fascinating, like talking about how we developed this espresso book machine. Um, but unfortunately, the machine that was on display in the lobby 
costs $150,000. So it's quite an investment. So unless you're a very large institution or um, maybe like Harvard Bookstore, uh, you know, New York Public Library, something like that, it, it was a little out of my range. Um, supposedly, like the, the cheaper version runs around 100 grand, uh, including the, the two printers that you need, but it's still a little outside of my budget. Uh, I was looking to, uh, I wanted to print um, uh, a thousand copies of my book for somewhere between two thousand and three thousand dollars. So, okay. So, going ahead. So basically, I, I chose not to go the traditional publishing route, and I decided to self-publish. And I specifically wanted a hardcover, like a, I mean a a hard copy, because I know, um, and, and then I'd get a. a you know, an ebook to complement it. Uh, the, the reason I chose to go with a print book is because uh, when I was working at McSweeney's Publishing, um, some of the editors sort of had a uh, philosophy that uh, often the presentation of the book is sometimes as important as the content itself. And I really wanted to get some good layout and design uh, in the book, and I had some other features that I thought would kind of enhance uh, the book, such as uh, I created uh, the world's largest and most difficult Jorge Luis Borges themed crossword puzzle. So this is in the back of my book. And for the ebook, I, you know, you, you can include it, but it, it doesn't really have the same effect. And I actually had the Googler, uh, Tyler Hinman, uh, help me out with this. He laid out the grid. And he's the, uh, the former national crossword puzzle champion. So I had a little bit of help with that. Um, so. So moving on, so uh, this right here, I decided that I wanted to use 100% cotton archival quality paper, uh, paper that lasts for hundreds of years. So I ended up doing some paper sourcing. I found Expedix in Berkeley had some of the best rate. Uh, also, for very special editions of my book, I wanted to do a reproduction of this 52-inch uh, by 42-inch map of Buenos Aires, uh, which is actually part of one of my stories. And I found to do a reproduction at that size, it costs quite a bit of money. But uh, it just happened that uh, a neighbor of mine uh, back in Berkeley uh, has a printer to, to do the job. And so I, I printed out some, some large scale uh, reproductions of this really fantastic map. So, I'll pull it out. Basically, this is just so you can get an idea. I ended up uh, reducing the map in half because it, it was a little bit uh, too big and unwieldy uh, at the 52-inch original size. So, so now mo moving on to printing the actual book, I needed to print 65,000 pages to make the 1,000 copies of the book. And it turns out that my cousin in Sacramento runs a print shop. So he has hundreds of laser printers. And so this is me. Uh, I was very happy. We finally printed the first successful copy. It, it actually took uh, a bit of trial and error to get the, because it's uh, duplex printing in booklet format. So in order to, to print it in the correct order, often page one was next to page 114. And it was a bit complicated to get the printing down just right. but. Um, uh, basically, what, what I'm saying in this section is that you know where there's a will, there's a way. That if you have, um, you, you just need to, you know, pull together what resources you have, what ideas you have, and you can, you know, make your book a reality. So I ran a good portion of the manuscript just off of regular uh, laser printers. So there's some of the manuscript. So uh, this is my cousin. And I actually printed all 65,000 pages on recycled toner. So, uh, you know, my cousin, he's a pro at uh, remanufacturing toner cartridges. So he gets all these defective cartridges sent to his warehouse. And then he would actually take two broken cartridges and he'd diagnose what's wrong. You know, one was missing a uh, mag roller or, it, um, you know, the, 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 the chip on it was broken. And then he would, you know, take the working parts from one and then basically create a new uh, cartridge. And so some copies of my book, they're actually printed on micro cartridges. Uh, 
which, which is this black toner that has iron in it. It's actually magnetic toner. Um, and it's what you use to print checks with. Uh, because he'd, he'd been sent uh, these giant uh, cartridges and he was able to you know, build a working cartridge out of it and I was able to run maybe like 10,000 pages off it. So uh, th that's how I was able to keep my, uh, my bottom line very low. Okay, and now moving on to the actual book assembly process. So this is a friend of mine, Hillary. Uh, she's at the uh, book uh, cutting. So I'll, I'll just walk you through real uh, quickly through the, the actual uh, binding process. So, um, so Cousin in Sacramento is a print shop, and then my uncle in Berkeley uh, is a book binder. Uh, so I, I was able to use his equipment in his warehouse to basically go in with some family and friends and to you know, bind and assemble uh, these thousand copies. So basically the, the page was printed on eight and a half by 11 paper, um, but then to get uh, the final book this size, we used this paper cutter and it was like a, a guillotine, just sliced it in half. Um, and then to get the cover, uh, he had this gold foil printer, uh, which is pretty cool. It uh, yeah, prints in foil. Uh, there's my sister uh, helping with some folding. Uh, there's my dad. So basically, after you slice it in half, you need to uh, assemble the pages into a booklet. Um, this is uh, the actual uh, binding strip machine uh, right here, and it does uh, spine printing. And so, uh, yeah, so basically, so here's the stacks of the, the booklets, and then they just need the, uh, the binding strip on it. And the way it works uh, with this fastback machine uh, is that this strip has glue on it, and this machine like superheats the glue, and you drop the uh, uh, you know the the loose pages in, and then it inserts uh, the binding strip, and it superheats it, and then uh, binds it together, and it's a very secure bind. So there's a little shot, and then it only takes maybe like a minute or so for it to to seal, and then you. Uh, put it on the, the back shelf to, to let the, the glue cool. So then here's some of the completed books. Uh, there's a friend, Ben. So basically, I, I just assembled friends and family and had them uh, help me out. Oh, and th this, uh, in the back, this is my Uncle Dick, who's the uh, binding master. Sort of interesting story is when I, I went to him and I said, you know, Uncle Dick, I, you know, I'd like to make a thousand copies of this book of short stories that I wrote. And he was like, well, do you want to do, you know, perfect bind, saddle stitch, side stitch, hard cover, soft cover. You know, he listed off like 15 different binding styles. And I said, you know, I want just whatever is simple, easy to do. And so he was a great help. Uh, and then there I am uh, with the family. Uh, and then uh, this photo is a little bit about uh, sort of like in, in the realm of self-publishing when you're doing it all yourself. Um, I don't know if you notice, but it, I'm actually missing the P on the keyboard, and then I swapped it out, uh, the Q, from this side. Because uh, in, the, in the last stages of editing and revising my manuscript, uh, my, my keyboard broke, but I, I just had to keep going. And uh, it, it's sort of a metaphor that, you know, you, you're going to encounter a lot of roadblocks in the process, but you just have to be innovative, uh, think of a way you know, what, what's a workaround? How can I keep going with this? And so if you look in the manuscript, uh, there's probably very little usage of the letter Q because I didn't have it on my keyboard, but I, I had to have the letter P uh, because it's, it's in, my, uh, in the title. So, so there, so that, that's a little uh, brief presentation on uh, the actual physical making of the book. Um, so next, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, you know why print versus ebook, and I don't view them as mutually exclusive because I do have a version of the book on uh, Google ebooks. Um, I tried to uh, uh, put the book exactly how I designed it using Adobe InDesign on Google ebooks, but I encountered a bit of difficulty because when you export from InDesign into the EPUB format, um, it puts it into this. I know it's like XHTML or HTML formatting, which it has all the text there, but the layout is, is, is a little bit jumbled. So just to give you an example of 
kind of the spread layout that I used for my book, which was hard to convert into a, a ebook format. I'll open it up. So basically, uh, the way I laid out the book is that I did a uh, two-page spread. Uh, so you know, the way it turns out is, is like this. Um, this is actually my mom's handwriting. She's very beautiful handwriting for the title. And uh, when you uh, just do a raw uh, EPUB export, it essentially has uh, this background image, which is the writing of the title, Papers for the Suppression of Reality, as a separate image and then on the next page, it has the text. But doing that overlay, um, I found you have to go in and, and basically manually do uh, every page, and you have to be, you know, know, know a few things about uh, the formatting. And that was, I don't know, it, it was kind of difficult for me to do. Uh, also in my book, because it's fairly experimental, I have a, a number of fake advertisements in it. And so I have this, you know, fake game called Michael Pollan or Michel Foucault. Uh, it's the game that's sweeping the nation. Um, but doing this grid layout, uh, you know, when I uh, exported an EPUB, it, I don't know, basically the images were all over and then the resizing I did in InDesign didn't really show up. So what I decided for the ebook is I just exported it as a PDF and, and I have it on the Google ebook store in that format. And as for uh, Kindle, I, I looked at, you know, I, I Basically, I've signed up and I'm in the process of getting it in Kindle, but I haven't actually gone through all the steps to do it. I found that, um, especially if you're like a self-published author or if you're going through an independent publisher, if you don't really have the tech resources to do all the formatting right, uh, you'll just go with whatever is kind of the easiest path. And I think that is uh, one advantage for uh, the Google eBook store is that you can just upload a PDF and you don't have to necessarily uh, put the book into a proprietary format. Uh, and then, uh, so, let's see, I'll just flip through. Uh, but moving on, I'm going to give a, uh, a very short reading from the book, just to give you a little taste of what it's like. So again, the, the book, it's, you know, loosely based on this fictitious book that uh, Borges created in one of his book reviews. So I'll read just uh, a couple, a few pages from the beginning of one of the stories, and then I will uh, open it up for questions. Let's see. So this uh, story, it's called Borges' Metamorphosis, and it's a takeoff on Kafka's Metamorphosis. When Herbert Quain woke up on October 31st, 2006, from a night full of dreams of giants and tigers, he found himself changed in his bed into a 56-year-old, nearly blind Jorge Luis Borges. He stared at the nothingness of his walls until he recalled how things should look and imposed the images from his mind on his surroundings. He reached across his crimson wool blankets from the Argentine Andes to turn off his iPod alarm clock atop a bookcase playing Juan Di Renzo tango music. Sitting up, he took in the hundreds of vaguely luminous library books lining his walls and reminded himself that he had to renew his Borges Carlisle into Quincy books today. Herbert stood up and walked to the sink in his small college apartment, feeling an uncommon soreness and frailty throughout his body. His wilted image reflected ad infinitum in the mirrors on opposing sides of his perfectly square room. Wow, my eyes are going out. I really need to up my contact prescription. He thought to himself after he put on his contacts and saw a world of indistinct shadows. Bending over the sink, brushing his teeth, he was careful not to bump his head on the corner of the freshly painted medicine cabinet on the wall. Herbert quickly dressed into the Jorge Luis Borges costume that he had been preparing for weeks at the UC Berkeley English Undergraduate Association Halloween party. He lifted his backpack, packed with his presentation on Roland Barthes' The Death of the Author for his honors English thesis class. Herbert was soon out the door before he could read the quotation on the back of his door, which read, I should have known that every time I open the door of my room, I am literally opening a Pandora's box. The perfunctory walk from Berkeley's Canterbury House to Wheeler Hall was different today 
Herbert couldn't quite put a finger on it, but he saw that it was overcast. Herbert soon got his bearings, uh, his bearings, running his hand over the sequine leaves of the bush in front of his house. He was in a rush and had no time to question his eyesight, which seemed to further deteriorate each second. It was as if the depression that plagued his soul affixed itself to his vision. Herbert thought, if blind old Borges didn't need to walk with a cane and memorize the streets of Geneva, I don't need a cane to walk a mere block and a half to a building I have class in every day. I must stop reading so damn much. Let's see. Actually, I'll, I'll go up to the page in the manuscript. He heard the 51A bus pass on his left. He felt the solidity of the sidewalk beneath his dress shoes and the clack of his soles against the concrete. Stepping to the left, he gauged the drop to the street and felt the softer asphalt, hearing the deeper tone of the tar and rock. He quickly crossed Bancroft Way and managed to find his way to Wheeler Hall by holding on to different students' elbows and asking them to guide him. A girl led him through Lower Sproul Plaza, up the stairs to Ludwig's Fountain, past the students on Sproul Plaza, asking him to sign up for Calperg and under Sather Gate. She left him at the steps of Wheeler. Herbert saw the unmistakable outline of Wheeler Hall, making out the arching glass windows and Roman columns, or at least he could in his mind. Herbert started forward alone and suddenly slipped and fell, hitting his head on the warm granite steps at the southwest corner of the building. Sets of arms immediately helped lift him up, but his head was throbbing, especially a part which felt like an old wound. Third floor Wheeler was all Herbert answered to their questions of his health. Herbert was summarily led up the stairs by a courteous but insistent hand on his mid-back. By the second floor, he was out of breath and had to stop for a moment to regain his composure. At the third floor, Herbert asked his guide if he was at Wheeler, room 330. She said yes and opened the door for him. Herbert entered a different realm when he crossed the doorway into the English department lounge. Not only was it dark and filled with dry ice fog for the Halloween party, but inside was different for reasons that to this day remain unexplained. So I'll, I'm just reading a little bit uh, from the beginning. Uh, the story continues for uh, quite a few pages, and it goes into uh, sort of the interesting characters that he meets at this Halloween party, who also happen to be dressed up like uh, characters from Borges' short stories. So, um, so with that, I'm, I'm open to taking uh, any questions you have on Borges or the self-publishing process. Um, and we have a microphone right there. Hi. Um, thank you for reading. That was great. Uh, I have some questions. Um, first of all, I'd like to know when you published your book, and then secondly, how you let people know that it's out there. I mean, it's one thing to you know put it on the website for, for downloading from, from uh, Google Books, but, but how do you get people to find it, and how is your book getting known? Yeah. So, so partly why I went the uh, self-publishing route is because well, basically I'd written all these stories as an undergrad and then I, I really wanted to, to publish them. Uh, but I figured that the audience would be fairly small. Um, but I knew that there are you know, a thousand people out there interested in Borges and Latin American literature who'd be interested in this topic. So it took me just five months uh, to essentially uh, do all the editing, design, layout, copy editing, proofreading, um, and then printing and binding. Um, so I started in August of 2010, and then by basically New Year's, uh, just this last year, uh, I had you know the thousand copies of the book done. Um, had I gone with a, a larger publisher, it would have taken uh, maybe uh, 12 months to 18 months uh, to get the book out of the pipeline, and I didn't want to wait that amount of time. And also, I wanted to have uh, full control over kind of like the, the design layout title the book, the cover, and often if you go through a larger publisher, you don't necessarily have that control. Um, so, so essentially, yeah, I, I did the self-publishing to kind of speed up the timeline. Um, but then the actual marketing uh, brings in a, a whole new picture because what I've been doing is just focusing on you know, each step of the process. And uh, so uh, f for actual marketing, uh, there, there, there is a, a big book conference going on in, in New York, which is all about 
you know, how to market you know, do-it-yourself books. And the uh, kind of tactics I've taken is I've uh, selected advertising in really key journals and publications. Um, so I, I have an advertisement in the May issue of the Believer magazine published by McSweeney's. Um, and then I'll take out an ad in the next issue of N plus one, uh, which is this journal that as a readership, I think that will I don't know, kind of like the, the style of my book. Uh, but basically, I've been uh, just kind of used uh, uh, the networks I've established uh, just you know, through email list, uh, getting friends out to local readings, uh, also uh, going to local bookstores and asking, you know, will you let me uh, you know, do a reading? Uh, but I haven't really had a comprehensive you know, marketing plan or strategy. Um, I, I know uh, basically some tactics that they recommend to take, you know, are, are you get a bunch of followers on Twitter and then you tweet every now and then and you keep them, you know, in the loop. Uh, another tactic is to have a blog that you regularly update. Uh, but basically if I end up doing a second printing of the book, I would look to maybe go with a larger publisher, have like a literary agent, someone like that helping me with this marketing, marketing segment. But I'm... Uh, you know, I've been keeping busy uh, with the writing I'm doing here for work, and I haven't had too much time to focus on uh, the activities outside. But on the weekends, um, yeah, I try and do uh, book readings, uh, go to events, like I'll be at the monthly Rumpus uh, in June in San Francisco, uh, you know, reading there, and yeah, just slowly selling copies, get my name out there. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I have a couple questions. Um, the first one is uh, you said you worked for a large publisher, a large scale publisher, yeah. McSweeney's, the independent one, and then you did the self-publishing route. So what would you say like, um, are the specific differences between like editing, um, design and layout, uh, adding the little finishing touches, uh, marketing you already talked a little bit about, um, all those different things you know, between the three tracks. And then the second one is, um, my, uh, another question about uh, why specifically did you t choose to go with InDesign? Uh, maybe you're familiar with LaTeX. Did you think about those, that type of option or, or, or other options? How did you decide which one to pick? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so uh, the reason I went with InDesign is because I had some experience working with it uh, at McSweeney's and I already had uh, InDesign CS3 uh, on my Mac at home and so I just you know, kind of went with that because I heard that's what people use. Um, but I, I looked into Cork uh, and some other programs which I would have had to have purchased to do it. And I even considered, you know, Microsoft Word or Google Docs, but it didn't really have the, the type of like margin control and layout that, uh, that I wanted. Uh, and then the, the other portion of your question was uh, regarding, um, uh, yeah, what, what was it regarding? Uh, if you're talking about the same question, it was about uh, yeah. specifically about LaTeX, and if you considered using that, because I understand that's very good for doing, uh, for separating layout and design from content creation, uh, mm -hmm. and then yeah. uh, being able to have you know, maybe even give hand that off to somebody else to do the design of the actual layout. Um, so that yeah. was one. Th that was one thing, and then the other okay. thing was yeah. having gone through the three different streams: yeah. independent publishing. Uh, uh, small publisher, large publisher, um, and in particular I'm interested in like your, your, your experience with editing, like what kind of support do you get in editing and marketing in the other two different tracks, beside, you know, outside of self-publishing? I guess in self-publishing you don't really get any support, right? Yeah, yeah, so, um, let's see. So o other routes for self-publishing I, I considered was lulu.com. Um, uh, which is one of those do-it-yourself sites where you can upload a PDF of your manuscript and then you can uh, print the book. Uh, but to get a book uh, that I was looking for, it would have cost around $7 a copy. And doing it myself, I was able to do it for around $2.50 a copy. Then I'm selling it for $14. Um, so had I gone through Lulu, uh, Amazon.com takes about uh, around 50% of, of the, the cover price when you sell it. So I would have essentially been printing the book for $7 and I'd only get $7 out of the sale. 
And so that's why I steered away from Lulu, although it, it's a great resource for people who, who want to get like a memoir out there or they just want to print um, you know, maybe 10 or 20 copies of their book to distribute it among friends. But just for, for 1,000 copies, uh, it was just too expensive for me to, to go that route. And so then regarding the large publisher, independent publisher, and self-publishing, yeah, if you go with the large publisher, you get a lot more support. Um, you get, you know, editing support and, you know, design layout. Um, but I think it comes at, at a cost in that I felt my book, it was very uh, unique and it was hard for me to describe. I just had to make it and then show it to other people. Because trying to describe early on that I have this giant crossword puzzle, this giant map, which is part of the story, um, these non-conventional advertisements for games which may or may not exist. Uh, people just kind of looked at me funny and you know it was just something I just had to go through and and do it myself to put it out there. Um, but for uh, a second printing I, I would uh, consider going with a large publishing house because then I would get you know the marketing support and resources. I'd have an agent who would set up kind of a more traditional book tour um, whereas right now I'm just kind of calling up uh, bookstores that I know, uh, you know, like there's one in Cambridge, Massachusetts called the Pierre Menard Gallery, and the title of my book is taken from the Borges story, uh, 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 Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote. So, you know, I've been finding kind of po pockets of people, but going the do-it-yourself route, uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of a high-risk, high-reward, and uh, part of the reason why I did it is I just wanted to see, you know, we'll, we'll could I do it? Uh, and I felt, uh, having worked with, with a lot of uh, great editors uh, uh, over the years, I, I learned a lot about the process. And you know, I still uh, reached out to them, and I had friends you know, look over the manuscript, and, and many were kind to help with sort of that proofreading, copy editing. Uh, and then with the design, I, I consulted with uh, you know, various people I, I knew, but I ended up just kind of you know, just going ahead with it and seeing how it turned out. Yeah. See if I keep my questions organized. So you are on Amazon, I see. Um, yeah. So what was your actual process for getting on Amazon? Um, do you just, you printed them, you sent them a couple copies and you're using their standard independent publisher route? Yeah, yeah, so I, I'm going through Amazon Advantage and uh, it's fairly slow to get listed on there. So mm -hmm. basically, you uh, well, well, I went through the process where I got an ISBN first through through Bowker rating okay. agency, and through Bowker you, you have to buy ISBNs in sets of ten. Okay. And it's around like hundred and seventy five dollars for a set of ten. So you, so, gotta, so you bought a full set of ten ISBNs. Yeah. Yeah, and you're yeah, barcoded so. on the back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, yeah, did that, and then um, I also. Uh, got a Library of Congress catalog number. Hmm. And that was actually pretty easy. You just go on the Library of Congress site, and then you say, you know, I have this book. This is the estimated publication date. Um, and they don't really even verify too, too well to see, like, well, is this a, a real book, or is it a fake book, which mine kind of is. But uh, they, you know, I still have it, uh, you know, on the book. And then when you submit it to Amazon, they go off the ISBN. And so, uh, yeah, I have the uh, yeah, ISBN number for it, and uh, basically they, they request one copy, and uh, kind of the way the agreement works, it's on consignment, so you ship it out to them, and that costs like $2 or, you know, two fifty, and then uh, cover price is 14 and then they sell it, and then they give you about uh, 7 back. Yeah, they're going to take uh, the like the fifty-five percent commission, something yeah, like that. Yeah, okay, yeah, so that's done that. through that that yeah. program. Yeah, so so it's nice that it's up there and it's getting out, but you know the profit margin is a lot better if I go to a local bookshop or if I, hmm. you know, just sell it on my own at, at events. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So did you you used a lot of volunteer? I mean, you basically did a friends and family kind of model for the the labor on this, yeah. right? So did you look yeah. at simply did you get quotes on simply jobbing this out to a local Bay Area print shop? I know you did some custom stuff with the foil cover, the inserts, but it seems to me that for a thousand copy print run, there'd be plenty of print shops. Maybe not. I mean, you could get places in the Midwest, and then they'll just UPS it. Did you did you compare those prices? Yeah, I, I looked into um, certain print shops, like there's, well, there's OD Printing in Iceland, and there's Westcan Printing in Canada, 
which um, uh, it's what McSweeney's uses for their kind of specialized books. Hmm. But um, I didn't look too much at, at local, well, I, I looked a bit at local copy shops and it was, it was a bit prohibitive, uh, the, uh, you know, the amount. But I, I decided I, because I had uh, uh, the resource from my cousin who could essentially just print all the pages on recycled toner, that that was the route I chose. And also uh, going around kind of the specialty paper, around the archival quality paper, um, hmm. uh, it yeah. basically no one or very few people uh, print off of uh, the, okay. you know, the, this type of paper. So you anymore. wanted certain physical material control and, yeah. and the do-it-yourself. I'm just, you know, for, for yeah. most, most folks don't want to deal with, right, and, and yeah. with 65,000 pages and doing your own binding and your yeah. own gluing, et cetera, right? Yeah. And so yeah. um, I just wondered if you had looked at that or, you know, did you yeah. look at Amazon CreateSpace, for example, because for 1,000 copies black and white, you know, it's pretty low. But again, they're not going to let you insert full color maps and it sounds like you did that and so on and no foil embossed covers. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, basically, the, the premise I had was that I felt the book was non-conventional and so I wanted to take yeah. an actual, like, non-conventional style, you know, for how the book looks. And, you know, by doing the, you know, this type of tape bind and, and gold foil print and, yeah, with the, the map and crossword puzzle insert, yeah. I, I felt it kind of, the, the form of the book uh, mirrors uh, the content. So your costs uh, were like, what, $2 a copy for, that's for, not counting the labor, which is free? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but basically kind of the, the the message I want want to share is that, um, you know, if you have an idea, and I feel that everyone has a certain story that they have to tell, and especially people in the room probably have a really specific area of expertise that, you know, they know better than almost anyone else, and that, you know, to, to not let um, kind of the, you know, that you need to get a Manhattan-based large publishing house to endorse your work to be able to get it out there, but you can essentially just uh, export it in a PDF and then uh, just get an ISBN and then put it on um, Google eBooks or you can, you know, have it on Kindle. Um, uh, another avenue, uh, w w w which I've seen, well, some of the print-on-demand services, I have friends who put out uh, books through those and then when I got them, uh, it felt like they had been, like, sent off to China and then they pr were printed I don't know, they were like, you know, it was running over and edges were bleeding. It, it didn't really look like a lot of like care and time was spent in, you know, physical copy of the book. And that if it's going to be sloppy like that, you might as well have uh, an electronic only version of it, you know, where you can, you know, definitely control that and have that clean. And so kind of the argument today is that if you want to differentiate yourself, you know, why should you buy the, the physical copy? And sort of the argument that I've put in is that, you know, I have these cool add-ons, but also it's, it's very unique in that, you know, some of these copies can actually be read by check scanners because it's magnetic toner. Uh, also, I individually numbered uh, every copy by hand. Uh, and, you know, there, there's sort of this kind of quirkiness to it that uh, you don't get in, uh, in an electronic edition, although the scalability for ebooks, it you know, it far outpasses this. So, yeah. So. yeah. Um, are you able to get any bookstores? Uh, like, I probably not like a big chain bookstore, but like uh, independent bookstores. Are they receptive to taking some copies of your book and keeping them on the shelves? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, the book it's being carried right now at University Press Books in Berkeley, and that's where I had my book release party. Uh, and then it's at Dog-Eared Books in the Mission District. Um, it's at um, Modern Times Bookstore in the Mission. I have it at Latinos Libros, or Libros Latinos in uh, the Mission District, and at Adobe Books as well. So, And can you talk about the process of getting it into those bookstores? What yeah. kind of deal do they, do they give you? Like, what, how do you negotiate that? How do yeah, you navigate so, that whole thing? So basically, you go in, you dress nice, you know, make make sure you don't look like a bum off the street, and you say, "Hey, you know, I, I you know, wrote this book," um, and I went to these sort of kind of quirky bookshops, so they know like who Jorge Luis Borges is. And I said, "You know, I wrote this book. It's kind of fan fiction stories I did related to Borges," and then 
you know, if they're doing crossword or something, then I'll break out the crossword puzzle, and they'll be like, wow, you know, how did you have the, you know, 115 clue crossword puzzle? That, that's a bit, a bit over the top. And then, um, yeah, you just go in, and then they'll say, yeah, I'll take one or two copies, and then they'll do it at, like, 60, 40. Or often, they'll just give you, like, $8 right there. So I get 60, they get 40. Yeah, but it, it's not really a venture to really make big money out of, you know, I'll, I'll probably end the year, you know, breaking even, uh, you know, for my expenses. But, you know, it's just something just kind of get the books out in circulation. And part of it, I think, is that, uh, especially if you're a first-time author, you need to be very realistic about audience. Uh, so when, when I was working at, uh, you know, Pearson especially, uh, people thought that you know, if you're a first-time author, automatically Penguin or one of its imprints would want to publish you and you'd get reviewed in the New York Times Book Review and things like that. But you need to start out, I, I think, just from, you know, grassroots, kind of build your community and, and be, you know, kind of honest that, you know, the book you have, it's not going to be the next Harry Potter. But you, you want to get it out to kind of a small niche, kind of committed group of people. And I feel uh, using the internet and, for instance, taking out an AdWords ad for the keyword Jorge Luis Borges. So you have, you know, this, this show up um, or, you know, there's a lot of tactics you can take um, to, you know, really market yourself and position yourself. Uh, and, yeah, and so I, I think next, you know, when I have time and I'm in North Beach, I'll take some copies to City Lights Books and, you know, they'll, they'll probably take a couple. And then, you know, if it starts selling there, then um, yeah, then they'll, they'll ask uh, for some more. But yeah, that's kind of yeah, what, what you do. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Matt, for a really interesting talk. A um, couple of questions. Uh, how did you decide on the font that you picked here and uh, the line spacing and some of these more typographical questions? Uh, and I assume you wanted, in your effort to maintain control over the, the look, you insisted on a certain font and so, so forth. So regarding the font, uh, I actually have a note about the typeset. Uh, and I have this whole story of how Garamond was brought from Scotland and, and all that. But uh, if you I don't know, flip through, I have a true note about the typeset. And basically, what, what, what did I write? So uh, Garamond, it was outright stolen from McSweeney's Publishing's uh, typeface. They use Garamond 3. And you know I, I like it. Uh, it's actually what Harry Potter is printed in. Uh, but there, there's a lot of variations of Garamond. There's like Adobe Garamond. There's all these different types. And the you know, decision, because it was you know, just me making it, I wanted it to be kind of a, a literary font. Uh, and I leaned away from Times New Roman, because that's what I did all my academic papers in. Then here at Google, we use a lot of like Arial and these really uh, like hard-lined uh, sans serif fonts. And yeah, basically, I just looked at some books I like from McSweeney's, and I just decided to go with a font very similar to theirs. Your approach here is uh, also an interesting story, right? So. I'm wondering if you've written a blog post or, or so, have, have written something detailing uh, just the, the process of, of building this book. And I think you're, you're exactly right about um, you know, making a, a book uh, compelling uh, to buy today in you know, this, uh, the e-book age, basically. So you've created something very unique and interesting. And I think a lot of people would want to kind of follow follow that that path yeah so yeah on on my blog I I started a um, a little series called uh, memoirs of the self-published and I have uh, kind of the first post on it is sort of an overview of uh, like these five books on how to do self-publishing that I read and I kind of gave my analysis and thoughts um, on, on how they're done uh, but kind of uh, an area I was I'm kind of uneasy about uh, is yeah is well at the Book Expo of America going on right now. Um, so so there, there there's a great like series of talks on well well 
for instance, the keynote address was why the DIY revolution has made it the best time ever to be a writer. And there's a lot of like, great talks that they're putting on. But basically, you, you have to spend the conference admission and then pay another $175 just to get in to all the talks. And I found that there are a lot of great kind of resources out there for the do-it-yourself author. But a lot of them, they're, I felt they're just trying to make money off you. And so I was just trying to keep you know, my, you know, my costs very low for you know, how a little over two grand can I uh, you know, print 1,000 books. And um, yeah, that, that's just sort of uh, the, the route I took. And I will be uh, putting up more postings about uh, kind of the process I did for you know, maybe a little bit on layout design, like how you can do it yourself, and then also around um, you know, the printing and binding and what are alternatives out there to uh, the other do-it-yourself resources. Well, I, I want to thank you guys for coming out. And also, I have some copies of the book available for sale if, uh, if you guys are interested. So thank you so much.